Welcome everybody. So my name is Monica Flores. I am calling to you today from the Woodbridge, Virginia city, which is on Manahoic lands. And I am very happy to be here. I am talking today on a, a talk called Step by Step, Building a Mutual Aid Network on Drupal. And we're here today at the Drupal Diversity Camp. And I'm asking for just a quick mic check if folks are able to see the slide and see my screen. And what, if you could just drop into the chat, if you are able to do the chat, a little bit about yourself, your pronouns, potentially where you're calling in from, and we'll get started. Great. So about this session, today we are going to discuss the process that I went through to set up a Drupal 9 website. And we're actually going to walk through what that looks like on Pantheon, which is a hosting platform. I am going to go a little bit more into the details of the content type, as well as the view, which is just a report of what that content type looks like as a list. And then I'm also going to talk about the flag module and a little bit about me. I am a technical project manager, certified Scrum master. I got my certification in May of 2020. I am Monica Deer on Drupal.org, she, her. I am wearing my favorite tie-dye t-shirt because I think I'm a little bit of a hippie from the 70s at heart. I am also acknowledging that my perspective is informed as being an immigrant, as an Asian, I'm Filipino by background. I have a college degree, I'm a four-year college graduate, and I've been working in tech for quite some time now, over 15 years. I'm married, I have three children. And I currently work at Lullabot. Lullabot, as was mentioned in the chat, and let me know if you see the screen. Oh no, hang on, you're seeing my speaker notes? Okay, hang on, we'll try this again. Do you see my, this screen? Yeah. Yay, okay, we'll go back. So we were talking about, uh, about me, <laughs> and then a uh, little bit about Lullabot. Again, Lullabot is a design and a strategy and a development agency. We have a focus on Drupal. There's me in my purple shirt. That's that's me. And I'd love to know a little bit about you. So if you can drop again into the chat, <laughs> a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your pronouns. Uh, maybe your land acknowledgement. If you don't know what a land acknowledgement is, there is a link that I'll also drop into the chat that can allow you to search by your location. And something to think about is everybody's here for a reason, right? There's something that you can offer and there's also something that you might be able to ask about. And just in the spirit of sharing and mutual respect and mutual responsibility, I would love for folks here to follow me on Twitter. <laughs> so that is my handle right there. And then something that I'm offering is I do have a raffle at the end of this. We do get a speaker stipend, but I'm going to do it and invest in a book for somebody who is attending here today. So stay to the end so you can fill in the form and we'll get you a resource at the end of this talk. So a quote that I'd always like to share is by Margaret Mead. She's an anthropologist. And the idea is that never doubt that a small group of thoughtful committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And when I submitted this talk to Drupal Diversity Camp, by nature, I wanna share with you, I'm quite shy or not introverted, but um, I definitely feel a little bit of anxiety when I speak in front of other people. However, as was pointed out to me, and as I continue to learn, sometimes we do have to get up to the front of the room and share our knowledge. Sometimes we do have to speak up beyond our capabilities that we think at the time. And sometimes we can share with other people our knowledge and know that it's not personal or it's not about one person or about kind of elevating anybody. It's about all of us sharing that knowledge. So again, I'm calling in today with that spirit that there's so many emerging needs in our communities and each of us here has a ability and potentially a opportunity to use technology to fill the needs in our communities. So I'll tell you a little bit about the need that I saw. In the past year, as we all know, we had multiple different ways that people were connecting. And I'll show you actually what it looks like. One of the 
mutual aid networks inside the DC area looks like in this. So I joined this group. This is a group that has different wards, which are the different areas inside DC and the needs, right? So there's general Patreon and Cash App. But one thing that I really was concerned about was this. People specifically need cash. Like when you are asking for help, you don't want somebody to gatekeep you. You don't need somebody to tell you any kind of um, shaming or any kind of you know instructions. You just need help, right? Like when I need help, I'm going to ask for help. And I don't expect somebody to then stop me in my tracks and question why and give me a whole history of the United States. No, I need cash app. You, you need it now. And so part of my discussion was, uh, oops, <laughs> what can we do to make sure that information can be shared and not just cash up. It could be also be shared for things like grocery delivery. I saw things like needing to go to the pharmacy to pick up in, um, pills or prescription medications, needing a ride to a job, needing a ride to the clinic. So what can we do to support each other? Because sometimes you might have time or you might have money or you might have ability and I don't have that. Alternatively, at another time, I might have time or money or ability and you might not. And so it's about shared responsibility. So I wanted to talk about fostering connections to communities, learning how to reciprocate. It's a very natural way for us as human beings to connect. I help you, you help me, we all grow together. And I wanted to build a, a light white, a light white weight way to ask and to offer help. At the end with that idea of shared responsibility, if you'll notice here, there's a thread, it's a weekly thread for individual cash aid. Prior, they used to do this only on Wednesdays. You could only put your demo or whatnot on Wednesdays. And I was thinking, we, we don't need those gates. We need people to, to share and grow and learn and share all the time, not just on Wednesdays. So I had a solution. Uh, how about if we build a pretty lightweight way to submit requests? And a request is just a request. It's like, I need something. I would like something. I'm requesting something. Could you help me with this? Right? That's just a request. And then somebody else who is potentially in a closed environment, right, using a, re a registered user, somebody who's potentially giving you their email so that they can kind of close the, the system so we know everybody who everybody's talking to can either submit a new request or fulfill a request. So what do you do when you have an idea? I highly recommend you pilot it. And I'll show you what my pilot looked like. It was just some thoughts that I put in a Google Doc. And the idea was, I know Drupal, I know it's a content management system, we can use it for publishing content. I know my colleagues here on this call, we're using Olivero, it's like a source, beautiful, lightweight, mobile friendly theme. Then I started working on what might a request look like. So ideally, you have something like an ID associated with each request, you can always refer to it, even if the name changes, maybe the author changes. Same thing with the title, it might be like dog walking needed on Thursdays in Ward 7, right? This is a little more complicated. The status to me was something that would switch back and forth. Like, yes, it's fulfilled or no, it's not filled, it's still open. I still had some ideas about that. And then we also had things like the description, which is just a big longer description of the item, as well as when it was submitted. If it was submitted way back, maybe more than 60 days, that might not be valid anymore. But if it was submitted within the last week, still valid. And I want to encourage you also, piloting, it does not have to be uh, in paper, in, in a, a document, you, you can do it on paper, right? So you, you can have your own little back of the envelope, just start drawing out your items. I love the people who do paper sketches, just cut out pieces of paper and start to think about what the model might look like so that on your paper, you identify the need that you have. And think now in your own community, there is a need that you know of that probably you are the only person that have seen the connections and you can potentially put that together. What I started to do is also build using this tool called Balsamic, which I'll drop into the chat. It's just a really, again, lightweight way for you to build out wireframes. And it's a, a, like a document tool that can help you build things. I've also heard Figma is another option for people who are better at um, graphic design than I am. So what I did in Balsamic was if I were to have this tool, I would look at it like this. It would have a list of requests, right? So submitted by type of request, some sort of description when it was dated. And then, yeah, is it fulfilled or not? So I'll just stop now. Any questions on this so far? And 
if no questions, feel free to drop it into the chat and or write it down. And I do want to get a show of hands if it's maybe one to three, if you can tell me your experience or visibility or understanding of Drupal. So maybe it's zero if this is brand new to you. You just drop in the chat. Maybe it's a one if you've been working it for about one or two or three years. And a two if you're feeling a lot more confident with it, you know how to work it, you have done sites on your own or with others. And then three if you're paid to do Drupal for your work. If you could just let me know in the chat so I can get a sense of who all is in the room. That'll help me figure out how much do I want to share and how much uh, makes sense for folks. So I used Pantheon to set this up. And so just as a way to think about this, Pantheon is a hosting company. It allows you to build products. It serves the database, the back end. It allows you to start up or spin up a Pantheon um, site, which has either Drupal or WordPress. So it's just a great tool. And I'll show you what it looks like when you log in. It's not this. <laughs> this is the Marcus Agrippa's actual Pantheon in Rome. It is actually a web serving platform. And when you log in here or sign in, you get to what's called a dashboard. Okay. And while we're talking, we're going to go ahead and start up a new site just to show you because it will be probably done by the end of our talk. So when I create a new site, all I have to do is say what the name is. And this might be, you know, DBI camp demo, the region. And then it'll ask some basic information about what you want to do. And do you see this URL? What this gives you, and I think this is helpful, is when you're spinning up a site on Pantheon, it will give you a domain name that you can then use for testing, for sandboxing purposes and for working with your potential partners. Okay. So that's Pantheon. And to be clear, uh, it's not the only tool. There are other tools that are available. For example, amazy.io is a great tool for hosting. And I know that I'll drop that in the chat as well. I know that for many of us, there's other tools that we can use. Okay. So I said, yep, it does database files and um, could do Drupal. I did that. It supports the dev, the test, and the live environment. And it's great for setting up a sandbox of some sort. OK, so going into a content type. So I know this is a big kind of mental leap for folks. But when you have a content type, it is the content that you use on the site. But you could have multiple versions of that. When you have, for example, a press release content type, you might build a list of all of the press releases. So press release is a content type, but each node or each specific item is an instance of that content type. So let's look at what that looks like. Okay, so in content types, Drupal comes out of the box with something called article as well as basic pages. And what I wanted to do was this one called requests. So a request is just a way for a member of the community to submit a request to the group. And if you recall what it looked like in my pilot, we had, you know, a title, a description. I decided to add a location as I was building on this, a type. And then I also added a web link, like let's say if you needed to have a link. And so all this is, is a way for you to start adding different types of fields to the content type. And what that means is from the user's perspective, when they create a different version of this, when they add a new instance of that content type, they get asked all the fields that you specify. And this is what it looks like. I have a type, publication. These I pre-populated. I have a short description, which is the title. I have a longer description, and I have a link. Okay. I'll also add this into the chat. And you'll want to register if you want to play with them. That's it. So that's a content type. When you have the content type, you can take your pilot information and just start to find matches. So I said, you know, Drupal comes with a new, an N ID, which is just a numerical ID. It comes with a title and it comes with a body. It comes with a date time, it also comes with who submitted it. So that's all very helpful. And then, in, yes, I am using Claro <laughs> for the admin theme. When you're actually creating a quest, you want it again to match what you thought about on your paper or on your kind of Word document version. So this is what it looks like. 
and you have the version to play around with on the live site. So now, I'm gonna close these. What I, as mentioning, when you're building on the live site, sometimes you'll find out new decisions or new turning points that allow, and Drupal, because there's so many contributed modules, which are kind of free, open source, able to be used items, you can add things in that you may not have thought about because other people have done some of the thinking about it. So as I mentioned, I added a location field. And now that I think about it, I may actually want it to be a Google map version so that folks can do a test in their specific location. Right now, this is just a text list. A couple other things that come out of the box with you for from Drupal is the ability to create a, an authenticated user, which means somebody who's given you their email address, essentially, that's it. So when somebody signs up, they put in their email address, they can put their username, Drupal can authenticate that person, like basically determine that this is a value, uh, valid email, and then you can continue with that. So that's a little bit helpful, again, in an environment like this where people are submitting information you may want to use an anonymous name and like maybe a throwaway email account. It's fine as long as you have something. Okay. When I was working on this, I did have a, a colleague, Gisha Nunez. And so when I was working on the pilot, I made sure to ask her, what do we think we should do? Because there's so many lists of needs and there's limited time, there's limited capability, right? Like if it's just working on weekends or not getting paid for the work, we can start to do a long list of what we might like. So for example, we don't currently have a flag as inappropriate that's still on the wish list or the list. I'd like to get some sort of verification badge, you know, check mark or something that says this is a legitimate user. There is an option for us to use external APIs to validate somebody so someone can bypass that authentication process. They can just validate with their existing social media network like Google or Facebook or Twitter, and that will validate you. So those are all ideas. But again, it's a pilot, constantly learning continuing to work on things. So inside Drupal, we now have the content type, which allows a user, an authenticated user, to create a request. The request then goes into what's called a view. So a view is a list of requests in this case. And the way that it works is we have the title, the authored on, the longer text, that location field that I mentioned. And then I have some additional items here. So when you break this down, Drupal is a great because it allows you to edit this view uh, on the fly. So let's say, for example, I realize that I want to change the order of some of these fields. I could do that using this view. I would just go in, rearrange. I could say, you know what, I would need authored by to be up at the front, apply it now, and then now this is the case. I did also split this view into people who were logged in versus people who are not logged in. So if you're not logged in, you'll see a different list. But now, for example, the author bot has been moved up. So super easy. Then finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about add-ons. So Drupal has a fantastic opportunity for you to use all of these 47,513 add-ons. And I was thinking that we might use something like a bookmark tool or some way for me to sort through as a user, all of the items that are on the site. Maybe there's a hundred, but I only can look at the ones that are relevant to me or things that I'm available for. So for example, if you do a search on bookmark or if you do a search on calendar or on um, date or on any really any keyword, you'll find items. And so the flag module is very well established. It is a way for you to assign flags to items. And so when you look at a module, you can learn a little bit about it. What I also look at is how far along is it? In this case, we can use it on a Drupal 9 site. And when you download it, this is beyond, the, <laughs> beyond this talk, but I do have another talk on how to install modules onto your site. What this allows you to do is create a list of, for example, bookmarks. And so in my case, I wanted to have a list of bookmarks Let's say there was something that I wanted to bookmark. I can bookmark it or I can remove the bookmark. So the next time I load this, this is now removed. And it is all handled through a contributed module. So I don't necessarily have to use it or learn it. Okay. So again, we have the content type, 
we have the view, we have authenticated users, we have the flag module. Now, one other thing is how do we get a request if it's been fulfilled off of the list? And so I was thinking, and again, I'm totally open and I wanted to get continuing feedback on this, is somebody could say, yes, I'm going to actually own this request. This is now my kuleana, my responsibility. That's a Hawaiian word for responsibility. I can say, yes, I'm going to go ahead and uh, take it or take take control of this, take, take it or take this into my list. And so I could mark this as being, yes, this is mine that I'm going to take over. And when it is, it's removed from the long list of everybody's and it's put into my own like queue, my backlog or my list. This has been assigned to me. If I take something and assign it to me, it's taken off the list. Then when I'm done with it, I can also mark it as fulfilled. So as the example, let's say there's dog sitting request and it needed to be fulfilled. Now it's fulfilled. Now it goes completely off that long list and it's, it's done. So that is how I was thinking that a request would go from initial submission to being assigned to a person and or being bookmarked, you know, multiple people might be bookmarking something, to being fulfilled, marked as fulfilled by the person. And then when it's fulfilled, it's removed off that long list. So basically, the all requests page is just a snapshot of any of the requests that are coming in at that time. Okay, any questions so far? And I'll show you again from the beginning if we look at this as an authenticated user let's say i go back to the site i see the requests i want to maybe create a request or i want to take on a request i will help with this request if i help with this i meant it goes into my bookmarks if i want to create a request it has all those same things that we showed it says there's a list of potential options maybe mine is not yet you know visible, which would allow me as the admin to start doing more sorting. Maybe I have a location, so Dallas, I have a short description, description. Maybe I have a link, maybe not. And then when I save it, that particular item goes into the long list of all requests. It's available for somebody else to take on. Okay, quick note about themes. So Drupal has this, as much as we have a way for you to look at modules, we also have a way for you to look at themes. So there is a searchable option for you and you can look, I typically look at maybe most installed or you know something that's fairly straightforward and easy. But what this allows us to do is to change out the appearance of our site as needed. So for example, Aldevero, it's now been merged into main Drupal 9. So it comes with your Drupal 9 instance of your content management system will have Aldevero with it. But if I needed, I could say, you know what, we're gonna just switch it back to this, set this as the default. Right when I set it as the default, it now goes back to that. And so it's very straightforward and easy. Now it's this Vartic, same thing. You know what? I don't want Arctic. I want to move back to Clara. Super easy. Okay, so I would like you to bookmark these two. I have additional video of how to walk through this. I actually documented myself building this. It was part of a hackathon, a 24 hour process. And I built the videos here and sent them here. You're welcome to look at the slides. You're welcome to look at the videos. And then I also have all of the links inside. You can look at the live site. We can do YouTube, the demo walkthrough, the slides walkthrough and all. And then, yeah, as a final, let's look at it from the version of an incognito window. One more time, somebody is now on Bartik, the other version. I want to sign up for an account or log into an existing account. If I'm not a user, it'll allow me to create an account. This will validate based on my username, my password. I am requesting a bit of a description of who you are so that I know, but it does automatically allow you to join. When you're joining, then you can then look at all the requests, create a new request. Oops. Oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> and here we are with uh, when I switched the theme, it didn't do it back to what I needed to do. Okay, so I'll I'll stop with that and then I can go into questions. Okay, so we have a couple questions. One is are there admin level access to essentially override another person's entries or actions, like reassign something that's already assigned, et cetera? And feel free to put your questions here into the link. Um, there are ways for you as the admin to reassign content. For example, I could take content and reassign it to another user. Alternatively, I can override the permissions for the entire site. So for example, I have an ability to specify that people are allowed to do certain things, but maybe I want to change out those permissions. If so, I can do that on the fly. So let's say, for example, I don't want to allow um, potential people to use the contact form. You have to be logged in to use the contact form. Then I could use this permissions grid to do that. So for example, here we're saying who can use the site-wide contact form is anonymous users, but only authenticated users who have given me their email can use other users' personal contact forms. Other questions about that? Uh, there is, as I mentioned, a way for you to use Drupal to set up content on your own. Here's the Pantheon site that I had created. At the very beginning of this talk, we had said we would set up a version. I think I might have closed that window, but again, on your dashboard, you get, I believe, three that you can build. Here's the DDI camp demo. Yes, yeah, so I have created and it's actually set up for me a version of Drupal just while we've been discussing. Um, I'll probably just need to troubleshoot this a bit. And <laughs> It will let you essentially work on a dev, a test, and a live environment on your own. And then finally, yeah, back to the quote. I wanted to, um, again, have you think about what is it that you want to accomplish in the world, and what are the things that you can do with your skills and your knowledge to help make a difference? It might be something as simple as your church or community group or mosque or your school, having a, a network of some sort where people can communicate with one another. Maybe you want to have a more open, like a public bulletin board. I've always thought about when you see things that are on paper, is there a way to convert that? So, you know, for example, at our grocery store, we have lots of little flyers on paper. I wonder if there would be a way to make that digital so that people can have a greater reach. Um, alternatively, if you work with an organization, Find out ways to make things a little more um, shareable and helpful and community minded. And again, never doubt that each of us working together can change the world. Indeed, that's that's the only thing that ever changes the world. And that's the end of the talk. I will send out a link for you to join my little form. And then I'm also available for questions. Okay, so if you're here, do fill out this form that I dropped in the chat with the stipend that I'm receiving from DDI Camp. I'm going to send a book to somebody who wants to learn something. Maybe you could put the title of your book or any other information. And then another question, do you do manual checks or do you allow them to create new accounts without checks? I personally do not do um, manual checks. I allow them to create their own account for now. You can change that as an admin on your site. And I know we have the next talk. Thank you so much for coming to this event and to being a part of the group. And we look forward to connecting with you on DrupalDiversity.com.